Well, it's an honor to introduce uh, um, Professor Weiner to you. I, I know him as Mark. Uh, we were actually college friends 25 years ago. Um, we were both thinking that maybe we should say it was just a few years ago, because 25 seems like a long time. Um, but it's uh, a, a real personal honor to have had uh, him visit this campus. Uh, when I knew him as an undergraduate, he was brilliant. And I knew he was headed towards great things. And of course, he has accomplished a, a remarkable academic career in a very short period of time. Uh, he received a dual degree uh, in law and American studies, a PhD in American studies and a law degree at Yale University, um, uh, completing uh, both of those in um, the late 90s, uh, I guess, law school in 1999. And um, was it the same year? More, more, more or less, OK. Um, and has been uh, teaching at Rutgers. Uh, he is um, also, um, he's been a visiting professor at a, very, uh, a variety of universities, including um, in Iceland, where he was also a Fulbright Fellow, and is the author of um, uh, two previous books uh, um, prior to the one that he's going to be speaking about uh, today. Um, I should mention that one he's going to speak on today is published, uh, going to be published with Farrar, Strauss, and Giraud, um, a fantastic uh, publisher in New York. His other uh, publications include Americans Without Law, The Racial Boundaries of Citizenship with New York University Press in 2006, and Black Trials, Citizenship from the Beginnings of Slavery to the End of Caste uh, with Alfred Knopf um, in 2004. And that was an award-winning uh, book, a recipient of the Silver Gavel Award from the American Bar Association. Um, so his, his background is uniquely interdisciplinary in a way that, that I've always admired and found very exciting. And um, I was very happy that he uh, agreed to come to, to visit uh, our university. So without further ado, I introduce uh, Professor Mark Weiner. Thanks very much. Thanks very much for coming. I'm really delighted to be here at the gorgeous, beautiful uh, Kennedy Center for International Studies and at uh, BYU. My only regret is now having walked through the halls of the Kennedy Center and having looked a bit at the Kennedy Center website. I am very sorry that I'm not an undergraduate again. And uh, perhaps we could have been that together here. Uh, George, thank you. Thank you for arranging this visit. And also thanks to uh, Corey Leonard and to all of the staff at the Kennedy Center uh, for uh, making this visit possible. It's really great to be a part of what you do here. Today, I'd like to share a few ideas from my forthcoming book, which, as George mentioned, is coming out with uh, Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. And I'd like to begin with a story of how our national security can be undermined by our failure to understand societies governed by what I call the rule of the Klan. Now, by, by the rule of the Klan, I include a broad range of communities whose law, social organization, and culture are structured primarily on the basis of kinship. Now, these societies include those that are traditionally described as tribal, but tribal societies, in fact, are merely just a subset of a larger phenomena that I'm considering, uh, as I'll explain in, in just a bit. In any case, the story is about the vulnerabilities that can result from a lack of intercultural awareness of how clan societies work. And the story comes from the American military detention facility at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. After the September 11th attacks, the interrogation teams at the naval base there were divided into a number of separate groups, uh, each of which was charged with interviewing detainees from a particular region of the world. And in 2003, the Department of Defense asked a young female scholar that we'll call Karen to lead the team interrogating detainees from Saudi Arabia. Now, the, the scholar and I are close friends. And though we've known each other since our first year of college, I learned about her work at Guantanamo Bay only in early 2011 when she disclosed what she had really been doing during some otherwise mysterious uh, years of her life. Uh, my wife, who's with me here today, <laughs> uh, and I always assumed that she had worked in some uh, branch of government intelligence, but we were never uh, sure precisely in what capacity. In any case, Karen doesn't conform to the image that most people have of a Guantanamo interrogator. She's non-judgmental, emotionally perceptive, modest, and kind. 
She's an active environmentalist. She's dedicated to her bicycle, to recycling, to her garden. And during her interrogations, she uh, brought detainees tea in China cups and greeted them with the truly heartfelt words in Arabic, uh, peace be upon you. I, I once asked her uh, what most of the detainees that she knew were like as people, and her instant, really passionate uh, reply was intensely human. Intensely human. She is also a highly trained academic, and she knows a great deal about the society and politics of the Arabian Peninsula. And this knowledge enabled her to spot a variety of weaknesses in the detention process that were the result of a widespread failure to appreciate the radically different culture of the detainees. Now, the, the military that Karen encountered in her work was, in many respects, still fighting the Cold War. During her training, for instance, Karen often heard military authorities talking about how to win, let's see if this slide works, give this a try, how to win, oh, Corey, I think we, ah, there we go, how to win the Fulda Gap, how to win the Fulda Gap, that's depicted up there in the, uh, the red arrow on our first slide. The Fulda Gap was the probable route of a Soviet tank invasion from Western Europe during the Cold War. And it was called a gap because the geography there is really, let's see, flat. Let's see, it's really flat, so incredibly vulnerable to attack. So how to win the Fulda Gap, what she heard all the time during her training. Now, there were individual exceptions, but as an organization, the military, as Karen saw it, didn't seem to recognize that today's Fulda Gap isn't geographic, it's cultural. The gap is the wide, vulnerable plane that's created by our lack of deep knowledge of other societies, just the kind of thing that the Kennedy, Senator, Kennedy Center is dedicated to overcoming. Now, a small but telling instance of this failure was the early version of the detainee database at Guantanamo Bay. The, the detainee tracking system there was a lot like similar databases in civilian organizations. Like here on this slide, this is the uh, uh, homepage from the Amtrak website. It contained slots to enter a person's first, middle, and last names, just like here. And that's just dandy if your name is Marcus Weiner, as Karen once explained to me. Uh, but let's say uh, you have a name like Abu Marim Khalid Mohammed bin Saif al Utabi, uh, it doesn't exactly uh, work very well. Okay. I should say this, this name is uh, it's invented, and I should also really emphasize that Karen has been beyond scrupulous in our conversations not to disclose any classified materials. Everything I'm about to tell you is widely available now on, online. As Karen interviewed the Saudi detainees and raced to find information that could prevent a future terrorist attack, she soon made a critical discovery. Because the Arabic and Latin alphabets are really so different, transliteration from Arabic into Latin script is a really complex business. Even a very simple Arabic word right, can be rendered into Latin script in multiple ways. The Arab equivalent of a common name like Smith can be transliterated, uh, well, as you see, many different possible ways. Uh, ABC News uh, once recorded 112 different spellings of the name of former Libyan leader Colonel Muammar Gaddafi. At Guantanamo, transliteration practices at the time hadn't been standardized, and so detainee names had been translated in wildly inconsistent ways. And seeing the problem, Karen tried to standardize the system. And around the same time, uh, around the same time, she began to prepare to brief then Brigadier General Jay Hood. He's the commander of the Joint Task Force Guantanamo. General Hood had requested that the interrogation team leaders uh, at the base be prepared to tell him not simply about individual detainees, but rather about the detainees as a, as a group. 
And Karen saw that many of the detainees behaved in ways that didn't make sense within the standard account that had been provided that the captives were motivated solely by Islamic fundamentalism. So some, some threw urine and feces on guards, right? That's conduct that is way, way outside the bounds of uh, strict Islamic norms. Uh, others asked for pornography. Uh, one detainee asked Karen if during his next interrogation she could bring him a beer. This was not uh, simply the global ummah fighting the infidel. Uh, Islamist ideology explained only a part of their behavior, and clearly there were many more factors at work. And then at one point, Karen had what she described to me as an aha moment. As she prepared to brief General Hood, she looked through all of the detainee profiles. She then looked at all of the transliterated names one by one. And the, the chaotic transliteration practice had made a search for common names among the detainees almost futile. But then looking at the detainee names in the original Arabic, and with a really determined effort to make sense of the Latin script transliteration, a pattern emerged. And two names in particular stood out. About a dozen of the detainees, that's one in 10 of the Saudi detainees at Guantanamo Bay, were from two extended families, the Katanis and the Utabis. Now, from her, her readings in Saudi history, Karen knew that the Katanis and the Utabis are two especially powerful, influential tribes, each hailing from a particular region of the Arabian Peninsula. And she also knew that both tribes have been locked in a conflict with the House of Saud and its allies since the 1700s. Now, to note just a few recent examples, the 1979 seizure of the Great Mosque in Mecca was led by Juhamin al-Utabi and Mohammed bin Abdul al-Qahtani. Uh, the four men who were part of a high-level escape from Bagram detention facility in 2005 included uh, Mohammed Jafar Jamal al-Qahtani. And among the detainees at Guantanamo was the alleged 20th hijacker of the September 11th attack, Mohammed Mana. Ahmed al Qatani. For these dozen men, uh, in other words, the Islamist war against the United States, which led them to Guantanamo, conveniently advanced their cause in a complex domestic tribal feud. As Karen explained to me, for some of the detainees, Islamist ideology came onto young minds already in a disposition of wanting to reclaim family and tribal honor. The Islamist ideology added a global, even cosmic significance to a centuries-long tribal feud, plus an excuse to pursue it with even more zeal than usual. But we Americans, uh, Karen explained, were stuck in our own cultural mindset, and we were analytically ill-prepared to make sense of the tribal signals that we were seeing. Now, the, the dozen men that Karen spotted, she explained, these are just the ones who had some indication of tribal affiliation in the Western Cetric name slots of the detainee database. Because of the first, middle, and last name structure of the data database, though vital information contained in a truly full name, such as tribal affiliation, was sometimes lost entirely. Now, when we fail to understand the cultural heritage of a great many of our enemies, their motivation for taking up arms against us in the first place will remain obscure, and we will be at a terrible disadvantage when we engage them in battle. Even more important, we will be unable to cooperate effectively with our friends, especially with liberal reformers within traditional societies working to advance individual freedom abroad. And that's a situation that I'm hoping to help uh, somewhat remedy in my book, The Rule of the Clan. The, the book is about the legal and cultural characteristics of societies that are structured primarily on the basis of kinship, that is, clan societies. Now, in the book, I examine a very wide range of clan societies across history and around the world, from medieval Scotland. Indeed, we derive our very word, clan, uh, from uh, the Gaelic, to modern South Sudan, to contemporary South Korea and the Philippines. There are really a diverse group, but all of them possess or recently possessed a weak central government, 
uh, and as a result maintained legal and political order, especially through the mechanism of the extended family. They are places where the clan is central to community order and to community self-perception. My book examines what clan societies are like in legal and cultural terms. That, it, that is, it, it explains how they work despite their lack of a strong central coordinating authority, how they can develop more modern constitutional arrangements, and what they have to teach us about what it takes to maintain a liberal democratic way of life. Now, I'm a, I'm a legal scholar. Oh, excuse me one moment. Still getting used to the altitude. I'm a, I'm a legal scholar, and so I approach this subject from a legal point of view. And from my perspective, many of you here will have a very different one uh, than this. I believe that the key fact of clan societies is that their law and their culture work together in a unique way. And specifically, the rule of the clan melds a decentralized constitutional organization with a culture of group-based honor. The two work together in harmony, and I'd like to talk about each in turn, that is constitutionalism and culture, and then think a little bit about how they work together and think a little bit about why that matters. Now, from a constitutional perspective, Clan societies are highly decentralized systems of government in which power is dispersed among a multitude, a multitude of lineage groups. In, in the terms of, say, medieval Scotland, power in clan societies rests chiefly with the McPhersons, the McDonalds, and the McKays, and many other discrete clans, rather than with a body or institution that's common to them all. Or in terms of, say, contemporary Waziristan, it rests with the various branches of the predominant tribes of the area, such as the Masood. And these clans possess the authority to discipline their members in accordance with group norms, and they're the basic institutions on which people rely to assert their rights and interests. Now, how is order maintained in such societies given the lack or weakness of an overarching government authority? Why don't they break down into a war of all against all, of clan against clan, tribe against tribe? Indeed, why has this form of social organization, which was developed first during the Neolithic Revolution, a long time ago, why hasn't this form of social organization, uh, or why has it proved, to be so powerful, so enduring, and so resistant to change, especially change that's imposed from the outside. And here I think it's helpful to turn to the work of uh, the great uh, anthropologist E. E. Evans Pritchard, uh, who in the 1930s studied the social organization of the newer people of southern Sudan, another uh, people governed by the rule of the Klan. Now, like the Pashtun, the newer are what's known technically uh, as a segmentary lineage society. I see some anthropologists uh, here in the first row. They'll know what I'm talking about. This is just one type of, <laughs> one type of clan society uh, that I examine in my, in my book. Now, in such societies, the bonds of kinship are exceptionally strong. This is different, not simply in degree, but in kind, than anything that we're used to here in the United States. I should say, including here, uh, continuing a conversation I had last night with Wade uh, uh, in, uh, in Provo, Utah. Members of a family lineage not only possess powerful feelings of fellowship with each other, that is, they possess what we call solidarity, but this solidarity exists in place of any feelings of belonging to a larger public or community. At the same time, members of separate lineage groups that are related through a common an ancestor will share powerful feelings of opposition to any group with which they have a mutual reason to be hostile. So in theory, that is, each lineage group will join with all of the other lineage groups to which it is related to fight against an enemy that's common to them all. There's a famous Middle Eastern adage that puts the matter this way, I against my brothers, my brothers and I against my cousins, my cousins, my brothers and I against the world. Now, in, in studying the newer, uh, Evans Pritchard translated this famous kind of bracing maxim into precise technical terms in a chart. Now, I know at first this might seem 
at first glance like a, a kind of a dry diagram, but I think it can be understood as something far grander. Uh, I think it is the unwritten constitution of the rule of the Klan, and it is as clear, succinct, and elegant uh, as the constitution of any liberal democracy. In the diagram, A and B represent two segments of a larger newer or a larger tribal group. Uh, X and Y represent segments within group B, uh, and Z represents still smaller segment within group Y. So here's how Evans Pritchard puts the matter. When Z1 fights Y1, then Z, I'm sorry, when, when Z1 fights Y1, then Z1 and Z2 unite as Y2. When Y1 fights X1, then Y1 and Y2 unite, and so do X1 and X2. Okay. Now, when X1 fights A, then X1, X2, Y1, and Y2 all unite uh, as B. And finally, if A raids another tribe, then A and B may unite together. Now, I, I think with Evans Pritchard's chart, we can grasp why kin-based constitutionalism creates societies that are so enduring and resistant to transformation. When X1 fights A, X1, X2, Y1, and Y2 all unite as B, that's a structure that has all the strength of a diamond. And for an indigenous, or far worse, for an outside reformer, breaking it apart is almost impossible, not to mention ethically dubious at best. In helping a society replace it with a new form of political order is a monumental task. Right? I think the chart also suggests why such societies are so effective at resisting outside military threats, especially when opposing military uh, uh, leaders fail to appreciate the human environment in which their troops are operating. An invading army can attack Z2 only if it's prepared to fight a ferocious battle with all of A and B. Now, even more, the chart reveals why societies like the newer can maintain long-term harmony in the absence of an overarching state authority, despite the natural tendency of conflicts to arise whenever people are involved in pretty much anything. Small lineage units like Z1 and Z2 maintain good relations with each other because the groups possess very strong feelings of solidarity. And that makes the settlement of disputes between them seem like a moral imperative to the participants. So the number of people involved in such disputes also will be necessarily small. At the same time, serious conflicts with more distantly related groups, say Z2 and the equivalent clan group in uh, in A, that will unleash a massive, bloody uh, war, right? Even though feelings of solidarity are less intense, the uh, possibility of a clash uh, is devastating. Now, the United States and the Soviet Union maintained a similar rough peace with each other throughout the Cold War under the principle of mutually assured destruction. So the, the entire system represented here in Evans Pritchard's chart can be linked or can be likened to the steel girders of a building, each of which press against each other with equivalent force and thereby hold the entire structure aloft. Far from living in a world of political disorder then, the newer and other societies governed by the rule of the Klan live in a, in fact, very highly structured society, structured on the basis of kinship. Okay, so much for constitutional structure. To describe clan societies as cultures of group honor, by contrast, is to speak not in terms of structure, but of values. In, in honor cultures, a person's, uh, uh, a person's social worth, including their self-worth, is inextricably bound to the perceived honor of their extended family and each of its individual members. Now, by the same token, members of the family are held collectively liable for one another's wrongs. Right? So honor cultures are societies in which members of a kin group are deeply dependent on each other for their social standing. Now, this value system supports a decentralized constitutional structure for two reasons. Now, first, it fosters the ability of kin groups to enforce their own internal rules. That is, it exerts this incredibly powerful uh, uh, social pressure to conform. 
But second, it helps diverse kin groups within a single region coexist in some measure of peace. And to see why, consider the following analogy. Uh, in a clan society, a person's social worth, that is their honor, is bound to the honor of each of the separate members of their family. Now, let's imagine that your own personal financial worth uh, today were structured in the same terms. And that, that would mean that the funds in your retirement account or your ability to obtain a mortgage or a, a loan would be tied not only to your own personal earnings, but also to the investment decisions and the reputation for financial probity of every one of your cousins. And you know the one I mean. Right? <laughs> in, in such circumstances, right, you surely would do whatever was necessary to ensure that your cousins maintained an unassailable reputation for fiscal trustworthiness. Right? Your own financial worth, your own financial power would depend on it. If one of your cousins were acting irresponsibly, you and your siblings would use the utmost social pressure, perhaps even physical force, to keep him in line and to protect your interests. In clan societies, likewise, each member seeks to ensure that every other member of their clan acts honorably. The principle of group honor thereby strengthens the internal cohesion of family groups. It enables thereby their autonomy and independence, which in turn promotes the constitutional decentralization of authority. Now let's extend the analogy just a little bit further. Recall that in honor cultures, members of a kin group can be held liable for one another's misdeeds. In our analogy, this would mean that if one of your cousins presented the member of another family with a bad check, the brother of the person to whom he presented the check would be entitled to uh, take out a lien on your home. Now, no doubt, your cousin would think more than twice before perpetrating that kind of fraud, knowing the consequences of his uh, behavior, including your wrath at being drawn into the mess that he created. Right? So collective liability thereby moderates infractions against other clans, enabling kin groups to exist peaceably despite being autonomous and responsible legally to themselves alone. So in, in this way, group honor you can think of it as the cultural connective tissue of a decentralized constitutionalism. Now, the link between honor culture and decentralized constitutionalism makes what happens in clan societies practically important to citizens of liberal states like ours for several reasons, uh, reasons why I think it's essential to study and to learn from them. For one, clan societies have the potential to destabilize regions vital to our uh, national strategic interests. And the potential for such instability, ironically, arises from the very principle of collective liability that generally guarantees inter-clan harmony. The trouble arises when the member of one clan wrongs the member of another clan. Now, in honor cultures, such conflicts can be, can be resolved in a number of different ways. To begin, the elders of each kin group can try to reach some kind of equitable agreement to redress the problem. So let's, let's consider again an analogy involving money. Let's say that John Smith embezzles $500 from your brother and then spends it on a new stereo. Your father and Smith's father might come together over lunch and agree that the Smith family, which doesn't have $500 on hand, will give your family, say, their motorcycle. That's worth about $500, and that basically makes things right. Mediation. Now, if the if or uh, agreement between two clan elders. Right? In the event that the elders of the two clans can't reach an agreement, then a cool-headed mediator might be brought in to resolve the problem. Let's say your father and Smith's father just can't abide being in the same room together. Their mutual friend Jones might convince Smith's father that in the interests of neighborhood uh, peace, he ought to write out a $500 check to atone for his son's misbehavior. Now, clan societies are really notable in producing these kind of mediator figures. Right? The, the most famous mediator probably in world history was Muhammad who even before his years as Islam's prophet was celebrated for his ability to settle conflicts among Arabian tribes and clans. 
Now, if no such mediation is possible, then the principles of planned society demand vengeance, retribution. And a well-placed act of vengeance generally renews intergroup peace almost as well as an equitable agreement between clan elders. And that's because when retribution is proportional to the original offense, it reestablishes equilibrium in the economy of group honor. Right? It makes groups basically even Stephen. Retribution recreates harmony and peace. It renews social solidarity. And humans have what is likely an innate sense of balance. And so vengeance typically is proportionate to the original wrong that inspired it. To, to return to the example of John Smith, to exact the value of $500 in embezzled funds, you might feel justified. I don't recommend this, but you might feel justified lifting a $500 watch, say, from the Smith family jewelry store but you probably wouldn't feel right swiping a $20,000 Rolex. Right? And the giving of gifts from year to year between friends, between family members, office workers, it's governed by the same sense or the same principles of proportionality. Vengeance is essentially the mirror image of gift giving. Right? But sometimes, whether by accident or design, retribution isn't proportionate to the original offense. Imagine, for instance, if in response to Smith's action, your hot-headed cousin decided to burn the Smith's jewelry store to the ground. Right? And in such cases, the reciprocal exchange of violence between clan groups can very swiftly escalate. And in the absence of a central authority, more powerful than the clans themselves, it can spin out of control. And that's the Achilles heel of feud as a mechanism, as a legal tool of dispute resolution. But today, in our deeply dependent or interdependent world, clan feuds are fought not with, spiros, uh, with uh, spears or arrows or clubs, that is the type of military technology that was around when the legal technology of feud developed but with automatic rifles. Right? Many of the countries of the world through which oil flows or along whose coasts container ships sail, and which are otherwise necessary to the economies of developed nations, are territories governed by an ancient form uh, of government, but awash in modern weapons. Right? They are medieval Scotland plus Kalashnikovs. And colonialism also frequently left in tatters the traditional legal institutions and cultural values by which these societies had long imposed restraint on individual behavior. Uh, a member of one Kenyan tribe put the matter in 2009 this way in the face of a scheduled election. Before, we were using bows and arrows to fight our enemies, but we changed to guns because we realized that compared to guns, the arrows were child's play. Now, the, the fate of liberal societies now substantially depends on whether the people of such countries can secure stability by developing forms of government that can conquer the terrible logic of modern feud. And though liberal societies can be of some assistance in this effort, naturally, if they are succeed, the communities have to do so on their own terms. In addition to being sources of regional instability, clan societies also provide safe havens for a wide variety of militant groups waging war against liberal democracies or other modern governments. And that's partly because clan societies are typically found in regions of the world uh, with weak or non-existent states where law enforcement is, is minimal. But more important, clan societies are organized around a powerful division between what social scientists call in-group and out-groups, insiders and outsiders and militants who either belong to a particular clan who can claim its loyalty are protected throughout its sphere of influence and granted nearly impenetrable shelter for the same reason that members of the Irish Republican Army found New York and Boston amenable places to hide. The wide gulf between clan in-group and out-group likewise hinders the assimilation of immigrants from clan societies into liberal democratic states. For instance, I strongly suspect that the challenges Europe faces today with its Muslim immigrants will be seen in time not to arise, or certainly to arise much less from religious differences than differences in family structure, differences between the nuclear family and the extended lineage group, 
and from the generally skeptical attitude toward government that such immigrants learned under the rule of the Klan at home. It's not Islam, but rather the social and psychological importance of extended kinship that typically hinders assimilation into a liberal society. Uh, finally, the rule of the Klan implicates citizens of liberal democracies, not only as a matter of our practical interests, it also deeply implicates our values, because the rule of the Klan diminishes the place of the individual that our own societies are devoted to advancing. Now, this isn't to deny that Klan societies possess many positive features, uh, but at bottom, in being what the great 19th century legal historian Henry Maine called societies of status, that is, societies in which the family rather than the individual is the central jural unit, Klan societies oppose the principles of personal freedom to which liberal societies are fundamentally dedicated. And these principles are justified not by a particular cultural tradition or religious revelation, but rather on the universal grounds of human dignity and reason. Liberals thus have an ethical stake as much as a strategic interest in advancing our ideals of individual freedom and advancing and assisting indigenous reformers who are seeking to do so, often at great personal cost. The, the anti-individualism of the rule of the Klan burdens each and every member of a Klan society, but most of all, it burdens women. And the fate of women, therefore, lays bare the basic values of the rule of the Klan and as outsiders, citizens of liberal states often find their own values clarified when they confront the lives that clans afford uh, their female members. The, the nature of this ethical encounter was made vivid to me one afternoon during the, the sweltering summer uh, of 2010 when I was having lunch in New Jersey with a young civilian analyst for the American Military Central Command. And I'll, I'll close with this story. Uh, Steve, I've changed his name, was telling me a, uh, a story about one of his tours of Afghanistan. A commanding officer had invited him to attend uh, a council of local elders, that is a yurga, that was adjudicating a case of murder. Uh, Steve pulled on his flak jacket, these councils can often turn uh, violent uh, pretty quickly, and he piled into his armored vehicle. And after a dusty ride, he arrived at the gathering where it turned out that the case uh, being adjudicated was of a young man who had killed another in a fit of anger. The, the details are, are really unimportant. There's, you know, there are a number of young men uh, in uh, jail right here in our community for a similar crime. Steve, Steve's an easygoing uh, fire plug of a guy in his late 20s uh, whose love of life and natural good cheer earn him friends wherever he goes. He's the kind of person that everyone describes as just a great guy. He can wax poetic about spicy meals that he ate years ago in low-down restaurants, and his stories of travel misadventures can keep listeners in stitches for hours. But Steve's joviality masks um, a deeply thoughtful personality that shows itself in occasional flashes of melancholy. And I saw one flash uh, that afternoon as he told me uh, this story. And, and something about it and something about the memory that brought it on has come back to me regularly ever since. Uh, Pashtun tribal elders are, like most of our own mediators and judges, really good at what they do. And the ones presiding over the murder case, Steve Witness, soon convinced the victim's family not to exact violent retribution against the perpetrator or his relatives. But though they managed to avoid a blood feud, they were unable to convince the victim's family to accept monetary compensation for their loss. The family just refused to allow the murder of their son to be absolved by a cash payment. So something more, they said, was needed to make things right. Now, prison wasn't an option in this community, really far away from the uh, central authority of Kabul, not to mention our own standards of criminal justice. So what do you do? Uh, the case was at an impasse. Then after much deliberation, the elders came upon a solution that everybody agreed was equitable and wise. Rather than making things right with money, the perpetrator's family would give their youngest daughter in marriage to the brother of the victim. Steve gestured emphatically as he repeated the sentence, the sister's killer would be forced to marry the brother of the man that he had murdered. Right, by giving away their youngest daughter, the perpetrator's family, uh, would pay a restitution that was much more valuable than money, and the families would now be bound together. 
Naturally, the young woman had no uh, say in the matter at all. Her brother's actions had condemned her to a life uh, of a kind of exile. Right? Like many married women in traditional societies, she would be cut off from her own family, but she also would be held at arm's length uh, by her new family as an everlasting reminder of the murder of one of their most cherished members. It's a customary practice known as swara. And Steve stared straight at me, his eyes fixed. He had this look of indescribable sadness about what he had seen, and he had a look of something else, too, which I had struggled at the time to discern, but which I later realized was a look of profound self-reflection. And he kept repeating, can you, can you believe that? Can you believe that? Uh, I've thought a lot about Steve's story since then, and my book is, uh, in some sense, a response to it from my perspective as a scholar of legal history and constitutional law. Uh, in the book, I consider how Klan societies can change their legal and constitutional arrangements, what they can teach citizens of liberal democracies about their own societies, how their structure suggests the needs for liberals to support robust policies of international, intellectual, and religious freedom, the spread of social media technology, and the uh, traditional ideals of the professions, and a whole variety of other topics. Uh, but I know that my publisher would want me to save those issues for the book itself. Uh, and so let me just close here with my heartfelt thanks uh, to you for coming today. Thanks. Hi, my name is Peter Lavercus. I'm an anthropology Hi, major. Marvelous. And I'm just curious if you're looking at tribes in general or if you're looking within individual tribes because of the large amounts of variation in governance between tribes. Yeah, fa it's a fantastic question, and it really obviously shows your training in the great discipline of anthropology. Let me answer it in two ways. Uh, I'm looking first at tribal societies only as one subset uh, of a larger group of phenomena that I class, classify under the term the rule of the clan. And that includes societies that at one end of the spectrum are the segmentary lineage societies such as the Newer or the Bedouin. And at another end of the spectrum include societies that have quite uh, substantially developed states but in which um, uh, there's a historical echo of past tribal arrangements that can often resurface, especially when state structures deteriorate. Think of uh, former Soviet Central Asia, for instance. Within, then, tribal societies, that is, those societies that exist on one end of the spectrum of the rule of the clan, yeah, what, what you need to do, especially if you're interested in becoming a sort of practical policymaker on the ground, is understand the individual variations within tribal uh, and clan groups. Uh, so the way that the newer work to resolve uh, disputes among them differs very much from the way that various, um, uh, say, matrilineal tribal organizations in India resolve their disputes. But uh, what I hope to be able to do through my book uh, is to provide a larger theoretical framework to bring them all together under a common rubric. So, yeah. My name is Lauren Barton. I'm a political Hi, science major. And um, you talked about how clans can destabilize regions that are um, important to U.S. security. What regions in particular in the world right now are causing the U.S. the most problems that have been destabilized because of clans. Yeah. Well, I mean, if we, if we turn to a place like um, uh, Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan, the, uh, the tribal areas of Pakistan in particular, we can think about uh, Somalia. These are, I think, the, the most sort of hot-button regions of the world that are especially important for U.S. security interests. But uh, that um, potential to destabilize regions of the world in which the United States and its allies have a particular interest exists really across the world wherever clans remain this um, uh, social organization that exists in the shadow of the state and can quickly uh, resurface. And I think we'll see 
clan violence play out, not only uh, today in Afghanistan or Pakistan or Somalia, but Nigeria, uh, Southeast Asia. There are many different areas of the world where this being a universal phenomena, uh, universal to societies that are outside of the, um, the common or the uh, common law tradition or the tradition of uh, civil law Europe, um, uh, but also within Europe itself, um, being a universal phenomena, the, the possibility of um, uh, destabilizing violence exists everywhere, right? you, you, within Europe itself, Albania. Right? So th this is a, a phenomena that is not particular to a uh, specific society or group of people, but is universal. In some way, uh, you can think of the rule of the Klan as a natural form of human social organization. It's as much a part of our sociological or legal impulses as the internal psychological drives we have are very much a part of who we are as human beings. So it is common to us all. But today, yeah, look to Afghanistan, look to Somalia. I'm Kip Augustine Adams. I'm a professor at the law school. Oh, hi. Um, to what degree do you think you can take the idea of clans and apply them to gangs, particularly say, uh, apply, them to apply them to gangs? Yeah, oh, fantastic So, question. so yeah. all of this analysis, picking it up and putting it down on gangs yeah. in, in Mexico. Right. And so they're not, they're not lineage clans as such, but there are some other, and that sort of destabilizing structure and violence and contest with the, Central government. Oh, as well. it's, a, it's a great question. Yeah, and um, uh, gangs are. You can think of gangs whether in. Uh, did you mention Mexico just now? Yeah. Okay. So whether it's gangs in Mexico or uh, uh, or street gangs in urban areas of the United States, these are forms of social and legal organization that are created when in the absence of the writ of the liberal state. And so when the, the, when the writ of the liberal state can't run into particular areas, when you don't have a strong central authority that's capable of maintaining order, then a whole variety of other clan-like organizations that look and act a great deal like clans but may not be based on the kind of uh, uh, lineage structures that uh, we find, say, among the newer of Evans Pritchard naturally resurface. And you find that clans, for instance, in their feuding structures, act a great deal like uh, the, um, the tribal and clan organizations described by well, various anthropologists. So abs absolutely, and I think if, if there's a lesson for liberal societies that comes from studying the rule of the Klan elsewhere. It's that we ought to be awfully careful uh, in uh, advocating for the uh, substantial weakening or deracination of the liberal state in our own societies, because in the absence of a state, various types of organizations that look and act like clans and that impose legal order not on the basis of uh, uh, individual civic membership among a group of equal citizens, but on the basis of various type of hierarchies will develop. And yeah, that is a, a great question. Thank you for it. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Charles Knuckles, Department of Anthropology. Hi. Anthropologists have been talking about clan level <laughs> organizations For a long in time. this country since the first department was organized back in the 1880s. Yes. And occasionally uh, people outside anthropology and in government yeah. have done the same. One thinks of the period in the early 1940s when the Office of Strategic Studies hired yes. uh, Ruth Benedict and Margaret Mead to undertake yes. studies of our adversaries, Germany mm -hmm. and Japan. Yes. But my question is, is, what is it in your view that accounts for the peculiar obliviousness of, uh, of the military and the American government to a set of, uh, of, of lessons that one would have thought well learned more than a century ago? What is it that there must be some kind of mechanism to yeah. account for how that information is systematically yeah. filtered out yeah. in government discussions? Yeah. Can you speak to that? <laughs> yeah, isn't that an extraordinary um, issue? Not being a member of the military myself, uh, my, my knowledge is limited, but I can uh, speak about the general issue. Um, 
So it's very interesting, the, the background that you speak of, right? In the 1940s, the American military either undertook or subsidized a whole variety of studies that spoke about very similar issues. One of the great studies, Ruth Benedict's The Chrysanthemum and the Sword, a study of post-war Japan and societies that are structured primarily on the basis of collective honor, laid out the issues that I talk about here very clearly, right? And, and yet there is, as you say, this peculiar obliviousness that keeps returning to, to bite us. Now, one reason surely has to be the Cold War. And so the whole military um, structure that we have today is organized not only in terms of its manpower and its weaponry, uh, but in terms of its interest in the human terrain of the societies in which American military forces might be involved around the great threat that we faced for for half a century. Slowly, the military, I think, uh, in my readings of the literature, is coming to understand, again, uh, these issues. There's very interesting um, uh, unit now, I, I don't know pr precisely the, the military term to describe it. In any case, a, um, an organization within the uh, American military called the Human Terrain System. Do you know about this Human Terrain System? Yeah, oh, of course you know about the, you're right, being an anthropologist, which tries to embed anthropologists and other social scientists with military units on the ground to understand and explain to them the human terrain in which they're operating based on many of the same models that were developed long uh, long ago, and I think that's a really salutary uh, phenomenon, although it raises, obviously, great uh, ethical and professional questions for, for anthropologists, but I think it's a really salutary phenomenon. I think it's the, um, the lingering shadow of the Cold War, and we've got some catching up to do. Yeah. My name is Grady Baker. I'm an undergraduate studying economics. Oh, that's um, great. Grady, hi. Question, actually, if you could just comment maybe, you've talked a lot about uh, some of the problems that clans can cause, um, both in, you know, in a military sense as well as a domestic sense when there's an absence of a strong state or a strong central ruling force. Yes. Then what would you suggest were some solutions? Oh. I mean, obviously, one solution would be a preventative manner of having a strong central rule of law, but then right. if clans are already in place, how do we destabilize them and establish a rule of law? That's a great. That's a great question, and let me let me also begin by uh, begin answering it by raising another issue that I didn't address in this talk, which is that just as much as clan societies can pose real uh, challenges to the security interests of liberal states, there are a variety of uh, legal, social, and cultural benefits that clan societies provide their members from which liberal societies have a great deal to learn. I just want to emphasize that as well in my response to your question. For instance, clan societies uh, 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 provide social solidarity, they provide social justice, they provide uh, egalitarian social norms, all of which are um, values from which we have something really important to learn, and they're values that I think if we ignore will threaten to uh, destabilize liberalism itself. Liberalism will collapse into its own hollow core unless we understand the values, the positive values of clan societies. But your question is, how do clan societies transform? How do they develop more modern constitutional arrangements? And that is a um, difficult question, but let me uh, offer two or maybe three, depending on how much time we have, uh, that I uh, provide in the book. And they are big sort of meta-level um, uh, programs that can, that might help certain clan societies develop the larger sense of public identity that's necessary to underwrite the kind of state that can put an end to a blood feud. And by the way, you can find models of this development uh, throughout history and across the world. Uh, two of my favorites are with the development of the strong state in Anglo-Saxon England uh, and the development of the early Islamic state in 7th century Arabia. And in the book, I sort of um, uh, make various analogies to uh, today's world, to those two uh, early states and how uh, they overcame or tried to overcome the rule of the clan. Here are two possible um, roots to help develop a larger public uh, identity. One, uh, advanced social media technology. 
social media technology. What does social media technology do? It reduces the costs of establishing links across clan and tribal lines. Right? There's one possibility. In fact, I think that, and, and then from below, from below enables the possibility or facilitates the possibility uh, for individuals to think of themselves in uh, terms of a much larger group, right? One of the, uh, well, call it a uh, technology, just to, to make the analogy, one of the great technologies of, say, Anglo-Saxon England that enabled the transformation of the culture of the rule of the clan from below in this respect was Christianity. Right? Anglo-Saxon Christianity, just as it was Islam that enabled the overcoming of the rule of the clan among the various discrete uh, uh, clan and tribal segments within the Arabian Peninsula. So social media technology offers the possibility of eroding the rule of the clan's culture of particularity from below. From above, encourage the development of uh, professional organizations like law, and medicine in clan societies because such organizations, true traditional professions, operate according to a, base, uh, 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 a set of neutral professional norms. And it's those neutral professional norms that, again, enable individuals to understand the society as something more, and its values, as something more than a group of discrete uh, clan organizations. You can think of uh, today's professional associations like law and medicine as being the equivalent of the uh, early rulers of Anglo-Saxon England who had loyalties not only to their particular clan or tribe but to a broad group of clans or tribes to which they were all responsible. Right? So encourage the professions, encourage social media technology, enable the erosion of the particularity of clan consciousness from both below and above. Two possibilities. Oh, hey. So um, I'm thinking back hey, to hey. a friend of mine who reported back after early 2000, after the 2001, that he had been in Afghanistan and his job was to deliver tackle boxes full of cash to huh. tribal leaders. And it always, it hmm. always uh, kind of stuck with me that this idea that we'd kind of given up on talking directly and we'd sort of, the tackle boxes full of cash were doing a lot of the talking for us. Uh, this is an early yes. phase. I'm not sure that that was consistent throughout the entire experience in Afghanistan. But I, I always wondered whatever happened to those tackle boxes? You know, who t what happens to this kind of, and so who gets the money and does the money that you get today increase or decrease the chances that you'll have to pay more money tomorrow? Mm -hmm. And, and how do they feel about, how do they feel about um, military commanders who come to them as tribal leaders and say, we want your cooperation. We'd love to offer you some version of liberal pluralism, but we have a sneaking suspicion you won't be that interested. So mm -hmm. let us offer you a lot of cash instead. Yeah. What, how does that play out in a mm -hmm. tribal society? So two, two thoughts. One, I mean, this is part of a broad set of programs that are seeking to provide individual clan and tribal leaders with essentially national incentives to cede local power. And money is one way to do that, but I think money or cash or the possibility of um, providing jobs programs to your uh, uh, tribal and clan members, a whole, whole range of values that can be offered centrally to local, to local leaders. But I think it's important to be aware of how the, the mechanism, uh, how the mechanism of that uh, dynamic works. Because if, let me give you an example. Uh, this is from uh, Fred Donner, great historian of early Islamic uh, Arabia, uh, describes how uh, Muhammad and the first caliphs uh, of Islam sought to do something quite similar. 
uh, and thereby bound many of the early tribal leaders to the central state in a way that's not unlike those tackle boxes of cash. You might have thought with the early Islamic state that uh, all all call them government-like programs, would have been uh, conducted centrally by a central authority. But instead, the genius of someone like Muhammad or Abu Bakr or some of the first caliphs was to incorporate tribal leaders into the administrative apparatus of the early Islamic state. So for instance, military payroll uh, was distributed not through a central uh, figure of the early Islamic State, but precisely through the kind of tribal leaders who are now receiving tackle boxes of cash. It was really effective. It was really effective. It allowed the uh, uh, forces of early Islam in the wake of uh, a set of conflicts known as the, the Wars of Apostasy to fan out uh, north and well beyond the Arabian Peninsula in, in very short uh, order. So the um, the mechanism of how this is done is, is really important and, and bears thinking about by people who understand the particular uh, structure of any given tribe or clan uh, society on the, on the ground in ways that a couple of students asked questions that were uh, about that kind of local political knowledge. Where's the, where's the cash now? You know, it's, it's hopefully bought some very slow degree of loyalty and incorporation to the central state, but these processes are incredibly messy, right? And, and we have to be, just as in fact uh, Muhammad in constructing the early Islamic state was quite aware that this was a very messy process. Sometimes they had to buy people off with loyalty um, through the, the gift of associating with you. Sometimes you have to pay people off through cash. Sometimes you couldn't really do anything about uh, uh, those who were intractable. Um, uh, and we need to be just as accepting as the, of the messiness of that process as he was. Uh, my name is Andrew Miller, undergraduate uh, studying accounting. Hi, Andrew. Um, but I was just interested, um, just from uh, your, your diagram, it shows yeah. that when there's an outside perceived threat, it unifies the people. Yes. When that perceived threat disintegrates or is removed or is perceived to not be a threat any longer, mm -hmm. do they tend to disintegrate back into their previous clans or stay unified? No, no, the, the disintegration is, once the external threat, it, this is theoretically, right? Things can uh, uh, have their own variations on the ground. But in theory, in the absence of the threat, then the unity that's uh, created when, say, C attacks Z2 dissipates once the threat is over, right? And it's gone. I should say, by the way, um, uh, accounting, right? Another wonderful, important profession that you need to facilitate through programs abroad. For instance, uh, if you want to, in the future, help certain so traditional societies that are governed by the rule of the clan uh, overcome their um, the the uh, governmental and social structures that are. Uh, facilitating regional instability, establish links internationally between your professional accounting association and your colleagues uh, in uh, a future more democratic uh, Afghanistan or Pakistan. Right? Accounting is another wonderful field uh, where you have uh, uh, great possibilities. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.